hymn number 21. Fairest Lord Jesus. <coughs> Yeah. 
welcome you this morning. It's a bit overcast and <clears throat> rainy, but we're thankful that the Lord has called us together and made us to meet in this place together in His name. The psalmist in Psalm 145 says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty works. One generation shall praise God's works to another and shall declare his mighty acts. We want to pray for those that are sick, some that are away and traveling, and um, we hope to have them back quickly. Um, contrary to uh, rumors, maybe my, uh, my wife has not left me. She's back here from Kentucky this morning, and I'm sure I'm glad. That's a... Uh, Everyone this morning bow for, for prayer. Our Father, we come in thy great name, the name that is above every name. And we do praise your name. We do declare your mighty works to the generation following. And that, Lord, is done by declaring your gospel which is your greatest work that you have accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that in these hours that you would forgive us of our many failures, our many sins, and cause us to know in our hearts and minds and our experience that forgiveness that you give through his blood. We pray, Lord, that you would help us this morning, that you would quicken us in our deadness, and by your Spirit, open our hearts to receive the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray not only for those that are here, that are gathered here this morning, but for all who will hear, whether it's by a CD or whether it's live on the internet, we ask Lord, in every place that you would bless your sheep, that you would comfort them in the things of the gospel and reveal to them the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for blessing us. Lord, we ask that you would receive our thanks through our great mediator. We know that we cannot even thank you in ourselves, but must have that one great intercessor and mediator, our great high priest, to go before you and to receive, be received and to receive of your gracious hand. We pray this morning for your people that they might bear a faithful and a true witness, that they might have the courage to identify not only with your gospel, but with your people. Lord, we know that to do so is to lose the favor of this world. But we know that he that is a friend of this world is not the friend of God. We pray that you would open our hearts and our understanding this morning, that you would enable me to speak right things about your dear son and yourself. We ask that in all things you might receive honor and glory and majesty 
that all the praise might be yours because we know that in ourselves we're absolutely nothing. But we thank you that we are complete in Christ if you have enabled us to look to him and trust him for that full and final and free salvation which is in him and him crucified. We thank you and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hymn number 133. Then, Brother Anthony, if you will wait on the congregation. <coughs>
in your Bibles this morning to the book of Hosea. book of Hosea, chapter 3. <clears throat> I'd like to be able to read the whole book, but we'll have to settle with chapter 3 of Hosea. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, so I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver and for an um, omer of barley and a half omer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. I call this message a picture of particular redemption. Essential to the true gospel. Essential to the salvation that the Bible teaches. Essential to believing the truth. And essential to the glory of God. Is it to have an understanding of who Christ died for and what he accomplished in his death for that people? This account of Hosea and a woman named Gomer is a picture of redemption. If you look over in the New Testament and hear the gospel that Paul preached, he says he preached how Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was talking about the old Testament scripture. And this is one of those passages that pictures for us something about the death of Jesus Christ. And that redemptive work that he accomplished in that death. Because the greatest error and abuse concerning the redemption that is in Christ Jesus is the one that is 
greatest in our day, which is to say that Christ's redemption is universal. Which is to say that Jesus Christ in his cross death died for all men without exception. The great problem with that is that it makes man's work necessary. Something he does to make that redemptive work effectual. It also casts a terrible light on the justice of Almighty God. It makes him a very unjust God. If someone who Christ died for and paid their sin debt is therefore yet cast into hell. You might say that man's view of redemption is either universal or it is partial or it is particular. When we say universal, as Owen said, it's to say that he died for all the sins of all people. If that be the case, then everybody would be saved. Or it is to say that he died for some of the sins of all people, and therefore everybody would be lost because they have no ability in themselves to make satisfaction for the remaining sin, for the least of sins. But the Bible teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for all the sins of some people. They're called his sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. They're called his elect. They're called by all these different names in Scripture but they are always identified. And so is his work. The work of Christ in redemption, as we sang in that hymn, is a finished thing. It is an accomplished work. It is a God-glorifying work. It is a successful work. And all because it is a particular work. Particular redemption is what is being pictured in this text before us. Because when God sent Hosea, when God sent Hosea whose name is salvation, or he saves, and therefore is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he went down there to redeem, he went down there by himself. And Hosea is sent down to the slave market at the command of God. It was to redeem Gomer. The name Gomer, some say, means complete, which in her case would have been complete whoredom, complete depravity, complete lostness in every sense. But he sent Hosea down here to redeem Gomer, not to redeem every slave. He came to redeem, and to redeem, as I understand it in the biblical sense, means to buy back by the paying of a price. 
It always has a legal aspect about it, as does all of salvation. Whether it's called a ransom, it involves a price, and as we read in this text, he paid not only for this particular woman, but he paid a particular price. What did he pay? So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. You see, the Lord here doesn't even use a price in a general sense, but he names the exact price that Hosea paid. And he paid it in order to redeem her. I say to buy back because Gomer was already Hosea's wife. He was already married to her. He was already in a relationship with her. But she had become his adulterous wife and her adultery and her sin had brought her into slavery and bondage. So though she is his wife, she is down there an awful wretch on a slave market, bound by the law, bound by what she has done and has necessity of being redeemed but she's not worth it. But this is the command of God. And the first thing that I want us to remember in this matter of redemption is this. When I say that Christ redeemed His people, I'm saying, first of all, that everything that they receive they receive as a gift of His grace. He gives everything, all spiritual blessings, God does to them freely. Freely. It says, For by one man's obedience, or one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance and grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Everything is a gift. The gift of righteousness. The gift of salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Everything that we receive we receive by God's grace an unmerited favor as a gift. As a gift. And even Christ Himself is called that unspeakable gift. Eternal life contrasted to the wages of sin which is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. So when we think about all these things given by God's grace, all these gifts, we would wonder why it would be necessary for us to be redeemed. Can He just give us these things? I thought about it this week. It's a little like this. Here's a man who for capital crimes is sitting down on death row under the threat of being executed never to be set free in any way for his crimes. And somebody sends him a gift. Maybe it's a million dollars. Somebody sends him a gift. Maybe it's a new car. 
Somebody wills him a gift and maybe it's a new house or land or something like that. But the problem is, no matter how much he is given, he himself is in such a situation that he can't use them. They'll do him no good. So when we talk about redemption, we're not talking about Christ buying all these gifts, which we are shown in Scripture, they are gifts of God's love, they are freely given to us in Christ Jesus, but what He has to do is redeem us. And that's what you find in this book. You find that is that redemption, that the redemption of Jesus Christ, it involves individuals. He redeemed a people. He redeemed this people that this book is written to, who in many places are simply described by Paul and the other apostles and by the prophets as us. He redeemed us. You see, when Gomer fell into her adulteries and when she left her husband, that did not end the marriage. She was unfaithful as far as her vows was, were concerned, but he was not unfaithful as far as his vows were concerned. And when she became a slave, that did not stop his love for her. He still, if you read the whole book of Hosea, he still provided for her. But now she's come into this situation as a slave and in order for her to enjoy any blessing after she had become a slave when the law had a hold of her and she had fallen into a state of bondage and justice had a claim on her in order for her to be saved Hosea had to go down and redeem her. And it wouldn't matter how much God gave us of all of what people call blessings. It wouldn't do us any good in the state and condition we came to in Adam and are in ourselves unless we're redeemed redeemed from our sins, redeemed from the curse of the law, redeemed to God. When Adam's race fell in him, that did not change or alter the everlasting covenant of grace. These gifts are described as gifts to a righteous people. Gomer, as, he pic as she pictures the Lord's people, was anything but righteous in herself. And so many have a whole lot of misunderstanding when we find that these gifts are said to be a righteous people, and yet the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. What's the remedy? The remedy is being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified or having been justified, which means having been declared righteous by God, how? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
You see, the truth is, Christ was not suffering the death of the cross to make God love us. But he was suffering the death of the cross because God already loved us with an everlasting love. And it was to redeem us from the slave market of sin, from being incarcerated by divine justice, by paying the debt, the penalty necessary to divine justice to set us free. To redeem us to God who already possessed us, who already was in relationship to us. He redeemed us from our sins. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us to God. It's not like we were set free just to do our own thing or be our own person or anything else. We were redeemed to God. We were redeemed to enjoy this relationship with God. We're redeemed in order to stand righteous before God. And this is what Christ came to do. He came like Hosea came down to the slave market and he redeemed by a price, a particular price, he redeemed all his people from their sins, his bride. Why were they his? Well, they were his by creation. They were already his by creation. They were already His because they'd been given to the given by the Father to Him as His bride. But they are now His because they've been redeemed by Him, redeemed by that price which is His death and His blood for their sins. We could have never redeemed ourselves. I heard Jimmy Swaggart one time say on the radio, he said, if you'll believe on Christ, he said, he'll redeem you. <laughs> no. If he's redeemed you, you will believe on him. If he's paid the debt, if he's made an end of your sins, divine justice, which has been satisfied, will now require that you be given faith. But of ourselves, we're just bankrupt sinners. Sin has left us like Gomer is a picture, wretched and unclean and in prison. And as the psalmist said, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. But in the greatest act of love, in an act of love that is not at all natural to our understanding. But in an act of love that is greater than anything else has ever been in this world, Christ redeemed His people. They're already His. They're his possession. But they're in such a state that unless he come into this world and take on himself human flesh in order to die, they'll be lost forever. I thought about it several times. 
It didn't matter how or what kind of beauty Gomer might have been at one time. What an awful, wretched, guilty creature she must have been at this time. She must have been such an awful creature that there probably wasn't anybody else, as we say, bidding on her. Who wants a broken adulterous harlot of a wife. But he went down there. I just imagine it was a shame to even be there for a man like Hosea. And you see him there, a man of some character and honor, and yet he's sent down there to redeem and he's casting this prize on the most unlovely creature in the world. <clears throat> but that's the will of God. Just like Christ's death is the will of God. And that's the good news of the gospel. The good news is that Christ has redeemed us. There are many aspects of that work that we can find being a part of what he says when he says it is finished. but especially redemption. He has redeemed us. He has redeemed us to God. He came to save sinners. He came to die for the ungodly. He came to suffer for the unjust. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, Peter says, For as much as ye know. Now this was a letter written to those who in verse 2 of chapter 1 are described as elect. <clears throat> For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Even the things that God appointed under the law didn't actually redeem. But they did show this. Redemption was particular and it involved a particular price. He says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. For you. It's a particular redemption. Look over in Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Down at verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying... Thou art worthy. These are those that John saw in heaven. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain 
and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Not every people, not every nation, but he has redeemed these who speak in that hour and say, you have redeemed us to God out of every kindred, tribe, and nation. Look over at verse four, chapter 14. Here are these redeemed ones also here in this vision that is shown by John or shown to John. Re Revelation chapter 14 and verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They're redeemed from among men. It's a particular redemption. Paul, when he was speaking to those elders at the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And this is what God-given faith confesses. We have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. He redeemed us by paying the price for our sins on the cross. And when you look over in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul, even in this instructions concerning the relationship between husbands and wives, he says in Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How would you ever talk about a universal redemption? How would you ever even speak of a partial redemption? If you talk about the redemption that is in this book that is set forth in plain statements like this and in great clear pictures like that of Hosea, it has to be a particular price for a particular people and it's already I guess I'm pretty much in what people call old school. <laughs> but there's nothing that gives me a feeling of satisfaction and ease and comfort anymore, humanly, naturally speaking, that when I see a bill that I charge something or or had something done that has my name on it and down at the bottom paid in full. I 
I once had some items taken from my home. And I, I really hadn't even missed them, but they were gone. And so one day I was just looking around. I was looking for a particular item, I think, but I stopped at a pawn shop. <laughs> and I'm looking through all this stuff, and, and well, I'll tell you what it was. It was silver thimbles. You, some of you knew I used to collect silver thimbles. English silver thimbles. So I walked, I'm looking in these cases and looking at all the shelves and everything, and I looked down and there are some silver thimbles that always got my attention. And I saw that there was like a bunch of them. And the odd thing was, they were in a case that had numbers on it in my handwriting. They were my thimbles. They'd been pawned there. No question about it. They were mine. But the pawnbroker, he weren't going to give them to me <laughs> unless I paid for them. So I paid for them, and they were mine. They were double mine. And that's what we are if we're the redeemed of Christ Jesus. We were his in every sense, but he bought us off the slave market of sin, paid all our debt. He redeemed us. To himself. He redeemed us to God. He paid the ransom price. So what is the result of all that? What is the consequence of being redeemed? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says this. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. Will you say I'm free? I'm free to do anything I want. No. <laughs> the redeemed are like that willing bond servant who has his freedom. He'd been set free by his master, but he has his ear bored to show that he loves his master and he doesn't want to leave his master. He's a willing bond servant. He's, he's, he's a picture of those who redeem, are redeemed but their liberty is so that they might serve the Lord Christ. So that they may follow the Lamb whithersoever goes. He says, you're not your own, for you are bought with a price. And what a price it is. The blood of God. The blood of Christ. He says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If we're redeemed, we're redeemed by the blood of Christ. We're redeemed not by some contingency plan, but by a particular redemption. Wherein Christ has shed his blood in the purchase 
of us. Therefore, glorify God. Give God all the glory in that redemption. Give God all the praise in everything. Because you are God's. You belong. And one of the things that blesses me most and helps me most is the knowledge that if I'm God, I'm His responsibility. <laughs> I'm His responsibility. He keeps me because He owns me. I once thought I had another master, but I found out I had a fool for a master. Hosea went down to the slave market. He didn't go there generally, just like Christ didn't just wander into this world and go to the cross haphazardly, paying for everybody's sin now. No, that's his greatest glory. But he went down. He came into this world to redeem a particular people. Oh, they're like Gomer, wretches, sinners, vile, worthless in themselves. But they're his. People can look at other people's kids or wives or anything and just say they're wretches. They're nothing. They did this, they did that, the other. Yeah. But they're mine. Hold your tongue because they're mine. And Christ looks at us and he says, they're mine. I redeemed them. I loved them. I redeemed them. I chose them. I redeemed them. I came into this world for that purpose and mission to redeem them. And I bought them by the ultimate Some say it's a it's a better thing to start talking about how valuable the blood of Christ is, how worth how much it's worth so it could have easily paid for every that's not the that's not the idea. He's only a redeemer of those who are actually redeemed and as we see here it's a particular people he says of, Red, of Gomer he says thou shalt abide for me many days thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man so will I also be for thee for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without a, a teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall the children of Israel re return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Why? Wow because of this particular definite redemption. <clears throat> Our Father, we come in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come in our weakness in this flesh this morning. 
weakness of body. But we know that your word you make to be forever mighty to accomplish the revelation, the manifestation of this truth to your people, to comfort them, to be good news to them. He hath redeemed us. He hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. Cursed is everyone that dies on the cross. We pray this morning that this would be our hope. That this would be a revelation of the knowledge we have about our own standing and situation. Not our own. Bought with a price. And that we might give to you glory. And thanksgiving. While yet in this life for this redemption. Say with those who already in heaven say thou hast redeemed us. And we pray that you receive our thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>